As you know, this podcast is produced by Beautiful Teaching, and we typically don't advertise, but I am happy to announce that this episode is sponsored by one of my favorite booksellers, Eighth Day Books. Eighth Day Books is also sponsoring our very first online classical education conference with 11 of our beautiful teaching consultants all in one place, one conference for two days. You can check out our conference details on the Beautiful Teaching website, but I also want to tell you a little bit about Eighth Day Books. Not only do they do a stellar job providing the most beautiful publications of books, they actually answer their phone and take phone orders. No robots, no holds, just real people who care. I actually prefer ordering books this way, and I have done so many times with eight-day books. If they don't have a book on their website, call them. They will get it for you. Check out their website, too. They have beautiful curated selections. They provide anything from philosophical to basic picture books for children. Anything you need, you can count on eight-day books to get it for you. Join me in supporting a real bookstore with real people who care about beautiful books as much as we do. If you want any book from my recommended book list on the Beautiful Teaching resource page, just contact 8 Day Books and they can order it for you. Their contact information and a limited time free shipping code is in the show notes and it's also on our website on our resource page. So visit beautifulteaching.com forward slash resources. You'll find my book list as well as the limited time offer, free shipping code, eighth day books phone number, and a link to their website. Again, visit beautifulteaching.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Well, today we're going to do something different. Uh, this podcast is going to have video on YouTube. So if you're listening in the car, there's a part of it where you may want to go watch it because we're going to be doing picture study today. And uh, I have with me here an expert in picture study, Rebecca Zip, and she uh, has a business called A Humble Place that I have followed for many years, at least six, if not seven years. And she offers amazing picture study tutorials, resources, just has an amazing resource, which we'll get into at the end of the show. But to get us started, I just want to ask Rebecca to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about who you are. And then we're going to get into picture study, our favorite thing. Okay. Um, so I live in Colorado and my husband and I have been married for 19 years and we have two children, and my oldest is 13, and he's currently in seventh grade, and we use Ambleside online, so I'm doing that with him. And then my um, youngest is 10, and she is in um, year four of Ambleside online. And um, we've been homeschooling, um, using Charlotte Mason's principles since we started homeschooling in 2016 when my oldest was six. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have been introduced to her in 2013 and I read Susan Schaefer McCulley's For the Children's Sake and um, was introduced to all of her ideas and just really loved everything that I read, the idea of um, teaching the children through living books and ideas and having them spend a lot of time outside and in nature and developing relationships with the natural world. Um, and just continued to read more of her things and then more things about her. Um, but I think what kind of was the cherry on top of it all for me was picture study. I have a degree in art history. So um, art is something that's always been important to me. And it was definitely something that I wanted to pass on a love for to my children. And the idea that she presented of picture study of how you expose children, even young children, to fine art and allow them to take it in on their own, not dumbing it down for them, not interpreting it for them or guiding them through it or anything like that. Um, and then also giving them credit for being able to appreciate it and able to understand it was so appealing to me on so many levels. And it was very different than what I had experienced in my own under my my high school and under education, but also even in college when I was taking my art history classes. Um, and so that's always been something that I've just really had a passion for and 
I love to talk about it. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm I'm excited. I'm, I want to share a little tiny bit of a story. Your story made me think I need to share a little bit of my story. You know, I also used Ambleton Online. My kids are grown mm-hmm. now. And picture study was one area that I fumbled around in, even though my mother was a music major and I used to go to college classes with her. So I went to a lot of music classes and I remember her art history class and loving it. And mm-hmm. I was under the age of 10. So probably when I went to the art history class with her, I was probably six or seven. She was in college forever, like taking one <laughs> class a semester because I was her child, you know? Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, um, I remember loving art history and I remember telling my mom, I went to Montessori school at the time and I said, mom, I hate school. I don't want to go to school. I like college better. I like being in classes with you better because <laughs> I loved the art and the music. It was so beautiful. Yeah. But when I started homeschooling my kids and I was doing also Charlotte Mason, but fumbling through it for so long, which is why you're here today, because picture study is one of those things I would have loved to have the tutorial you're going to give today is what I needed, but there was no internet and there was no, like, I didn't have anything. Then I did find a support group that helped me a lot, but I was so behind with my kids because I was trying to learn it as I was going. So picture study was was one of the gems that got put on the side because I felt like, we're behind the math. We're behind, you know, I got I to gotta yeah. catch my kids up in these things because I did have my kids in public school for a little bit mm-hmm. early on. And so, uh, but we did do some picture study. We did a, maybe like one artist study a year instead of mm-hmm. one every term, like what Ambleside does. Same yeah. with poetry. We did the same thing. We did like one per term instead of the whole year. We got better as the girls got older, but then they were high school and they were doing it on their own more, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I have to tell you this story. I have I picture study I love so so much and as I've worked closely with a lot of schools, I've gotten really good at picture study in group settings with lots of uh you know 20 people in a classroom or if I'm doing a teacher training 75 up to 75 teachers in a teacher training. Yeah. And picture study is so fun. I just love it. I feel like it is such a wonderful way to help create in a classroom that environment of trust. Hmm. And the students who really struggle coming out of their shell or feel like I'm going to get the wrong answer, picture yeah. study is the one link that helps those students to feel like they can enter into the dialectic of the classroom mm-hmm. and have, um, you know, a safe, it creates that safe space that then when they're discussing things like literature, those quiet kids tend to start to feel better about talking because picture study has made them feel comfortable with sharing their thoughts. And, um, but I have to just say this one little story because this is so cute. My, I have a granddaughter, I have well, seven grandchildren and my little granddaughter who is um, two and a half. And I'm, I've decided to give all my grandchildren literary names to protect their identity. So yeah. I named her, she is Pollyanna. She fits okay. the perfect I, you oh, know, icon of Pollyanna. <laughs> and she comes, she always comes running in my house going, grandmama, I want a popsicle or grandmama, I want a cookie. Well, recently she comes into my house running, Grandmama, I want to see the Night Watch. So Mm -hmm. she loves the Night Watch by Rembrandt. That's funny. Because I have these little matching card games, like, but they're art. Like, you know, the memory game where you match apples and apples. But I have it with pictures. And she was just kind of looking through them because I haven't really taught her the memory game yet, but she was looking through the cards Mm -hmm. and she found the one that's the girl with the pearl earring. And she got really excited. She's only two and a half. And she goes, Oh, Grandmama, I know this. I know this. And she runs over to my dining room and points up because I have that painting in my dining room, the girl with the pearl earring. And she was making the connection that she recognized. So I took her through my house and started showing her all my Vermeers and my Rembrandts and my Durers and my (laughs) all my art that I have everywhere and telling her what they all were. And I don't have the night watch up, but I said, oh, I need to show you this painting that I love, Nina. Oh, Pollyanna. I'm not going to tell you her real name, Pollyanna. And uh, she, she says, so we find some of my art books and I show her a big layout of the, of the uh, painting. And I said, let me show you something. So we go to my computer and she, and she, so we sit down and I show her the flash mob night watch. So I want all my listeners go to YouTube and Google flash mob <laughs> night watch because it's amazing. I don't think I've seen that. I'll that <laughs> it's <up>. so cool. <laughs> and they do this flash mob in a shopping center 
of creating the night watch the and they're running scene. through in the whole costumes and they, wow. they jump down on they swing on ropes and they they all fall yeah, down into there's place guys doing that in the background yeah. yeah they all fly down into place and then the frame drops and it's advertising the exhibit at the Reich Museum in Amsterdam oh okay 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 and so I every time she comes in she wants to see the flash mob but yeah. I also pull up the high resolution image from mm -hmm. the Reich Museum website because they have a high res image of night watch and I pull it up to my big monitor and I have it up there big screen above mm -hmm. where my lap, little, little laptop is that um, we're watching the flash mob. So when we're done, we study and look at the differences yeah. and she's two and a half and loves it. She recognizes yeah. so many things. So I had to share that story because it's just my favorite, like I'm getting good at picture study now that I'm a grandmother. <laughs> Better late than never, right? <laughs> so I'm excited because I know you're going to walk me through a picture study today, and this will be our demonstration for our listeners of what a picture study looks like. Now, I'm recording, and I'm going to I'm going to look at it for the full three minutes, but I may okay. kind of. Uh, for our listeners, reduce that down so they don't have to sit through it all and then yeah. splice it back in. Um, before we do this picture study and you walk us through the whole process, I want you to tell us who's your favorite artist. I know that's probably a really hard question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't I don't think that I have one favorite right. one. <laughs> I actually get asked this question a lot because people want recommendations for picture study. And so they say, well, what's your, who's your favorite artist? I like different artists from different time periods. Some of the ones that I really appreciate, um, is actually not an artist. I really love illuminated manuscripts from I Ireland. Too. Yeah. I think everyone should. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a giant um, Book of Cows reproduction yes. by Bernard yep. Meehan. That was a fortune, but I love it. It's one of my favorite things that I own. Um, uh, I really like Alphonse Mucha. He was uh, an Art Nouveau artist from the early part of last century, late part of the 19th century. And he was actually from the town in, <clears throat> excuse me, Moravia, which was very near to where my great grandmother was from. Ah. I just love his art too. Um, I love Vincent Van Gogh. I like the artists that we're going to be looking at today. Um, so I have I have a lot of them that I like for different reasons. So yeah, sorry. I, I that's can't. fine. No, that's good. It's the same way if you ask me who's my favorite author of books. Okay. Well, I've got two. That problem also. <laughs> that's a whole other one. I would say probably George MacDonald is up there with my oh, top okay. five. Yeah. Oh, and I really probably. like Howard Pyle a lot too. Yes. He's, he's just amazing the way that he wrote yeah. his language. Yeah, I know, right? And Charles Dickens probably be yeah. another favorite for me. Um, okay. So <laughs> let's get into picture study. I want you to walk us through what to do. Okay. I'm going to preface it by saying that what you said a little bit ago about it being a challenging, a more challenging subject that usually gets chucked first when the, the schedule gets busy is really common. I think that's, you know, a lot of people do that, but I think also picture study is kind of abstract. Um, even within the framework of a somewhat more abstract education as Charlotte Mason or, you know, not what we see in like traditional classrooms or modern classrooms mm -hmm. right now. Picture study is even more abstract in that I think we're used to just trying to add in more things to kind of enrich that education and add in as much as we can. But picture study is really about just a, an intentional time each week where you're allowing your student to develop a relationship with a piece of art, not with the artist, not with the movement, not with the time period, but just that piece of art. So your granddaughter getting to know the night watch just by looking at it is exactly what it's about. You're not telling her about, about Rembrandt. You're not, you know, talking about the time period or the, you know, Dutch golden age or anything like that. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. I'm going to, the way I'm going to do it today is the way I've done it with my kids for the last eight years and how I've done it in the homeschool co-ops that I've taught picture study in. So that's for kids ranging in age from six to 18. I've also done it this way with grownups and it's, it, I do a little bit more, but what I want to emphasize is that there's just two essential parts of picture study. And that's the quiet looking time where you're looking at the piece for three to five minutes and we'll do that. And then the narration time. And if you don't do anything else in your picture study time, just those two things, you've done picture study successfully. Yes. 
Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that because that's often how I model it when I train teachers in schools as well, because I often don't have a lot of background knowledge of the person to give them, Mm -hmm. which I know you're going to do. And I will also tell our listeners that you have a lots of picture study resource packets and which we'll get to at the end, but they, they actually have a lot of the information we might want if we want to go more deeply into learning about the background. Yeah. And in Charlotte Mason's volumes and in different parents review articles and other things, pamphlets from her schools, um, they do talk a little bit about um, giving a very brief biography on the artist, focusing on their childhood, and then also discussing like some key topics about the the um, paintings. If there's a story behind it or a Bible passage, reading that. But you have to keep it simple. You do not want it to be more, as Charlotte Mason says, a teacher's talky-talky, right. um, more about that than them developing that relationship with the art. So I guess we'll dive into the picture okay. study. And you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay, so the um, piece of art that we're going to look at today comes from an artist by the name of John William Waterhouse, and he is here. This is him, and he was born in Rome, Italy, and if I was standing or sitting next to you, I would ask you to point out where Rome is on the map, but you can just tell me (laughs) whence you found Rome. I found it. Okay, so that's where he was born. His family was actually English. And so when he was five years old, they moved back to London, which is also on the map up there. Mm -hmm. But even just that short time that he spent in Italy left a lifelong impression on him. And he had a love of classical things, of ancient Roman history, of Greek history, and even of um, other stories from other cultures in antiquity. Um, And that comes out a lot in all of his work. And what's interesting about him is that um, he didn't start off wanting to be an artist. His father was a painter, and he often helped him with some of his work. But when he came to the age of needing to decide his career path, he actually originally was going to pursue engineering. Uh, But then when he was about 20 years old, he changed his mind and decided that he wanted to be an artist. And a few years later, he um, was able to show a piece in the Royal Academy of Arts show, and that's what launched his career um, of becoming an artist. So I'm going to take away the map, and I'm going to show you the piece of art here. And um, before I show it, I'll give you about three to five, or not before, when I'm showing you, I'll give you about three to five minutes to look at it quietly. So Um, Just notice, you know, what's going on in the painting, what stands out to you, um, what colors you see, just all kinds of details about the painting. And every once in a while, close your eyes. And if there's any part of the painting that you can't see clearly, open your eyes again and study that part um, until you can see it clearly when you close your eyes. And just keep doing that until the whole painting is clear in your mind. And I will let you know when the time is up. So are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. It's been about three minutes. Do you need more time? No, I think I'm good. All right. So I'm going to take it away now. And you can tell me what you saw. Okay. Do you want to share unshare screen so we could see our faces? You can if you want. I was going to show okay, it again go back. when we're talking about okay. it. Okay. So, wow, there was a lot. Um, so it's like a king on a throne or a ruler or something. He's wearing like a burgundy tunic feeding a couple of pigeons. And there's a few on the back of his chair, which is just beautiful with this little almost art deco checkered black and white pattern. And then there's a sensor next to him, Um, beautiful like drapery curtain behind him. And then um, in the background, there's a green drape and the floor is like a marble pattern. And there's these dark gray marble pillars. And way in the back, there's two men. One looks young with like dark brown hair and a 
a, a tunic the color of his, the burgundy color, next, and he's got an old gentleman next to him. And there's two pigeons flying, and they're way in the back. And then uh, if you come in through the room, then from that direction to the right, there's two men that look like they're almost judging. This one guy's like holding a scroll, and they look like they're just kind of judging what's going on. And then um, there's a statue up on a pillar in the corner. And then if you come forward, there's some tapestries hanging. And there's a gentleman I would assume is maybe like a guard. His tunic isn't as long. Um, and he's holding the, the banner. It looks like an icon of Christ on the picture of the banner that he's holding. And then there's what I think are maybe like four, like, I don't know if they're priests or, um, but, but they, uh, the bottom of the hem of the two priests that are closer to the front look like they have saints on them. They have the little yellow halos, like even like maybe a, you know, some, I'm orthodox, so like orthodox iconography on the bottom of their mm -hmm. robes. And one is holding a, a book, the one in the middle, he's older to his right, which would be my left looking at it. The gentleman who's kind of bowing down is holding a picture, it looks like, of a duck, like a mallard duck. Mm -hmm. And his head, I couldn't tell if it was like a tonsured, like a monk, or if he was wearing like a little cap on his head. And then the other gentleman was, the one that was bowing, the older man that was bowing was holding a bouquet of flowers. And I can't remember what the man next to him closest was holding. I think it was another book. It was a book. A I don't know if it was a Bible or a book. But they were bowing to him, which also made me think he was like a ruler or a king. Um, I don't remember if he had a crown on his head, though. But um, he seems to really like birds. He had various kinds of fowl on the carpet in front of him and pigeons. Um, and obviously, he enjoys feeding them in his th from his throne. Like, <laughs> they're coming in and eating from his gold platter mm -hmm. that he has on his lap. Um, yeah, so I guess I wondered why he was doing that, like, mm -hmm. and the birds that were flying in, so behind those pillars in the back, I don't know if that was another room that the birds were flying around in, or if it was outside, but I felt like it was a room. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's interesting. He has lots of birds flying around in there, <laughs> enjoying his, his birds. I don't know if he's fattening them up so he can eat them. And then I also <laughs> thought, is it, are they sacrificial pigeons is this like a mm -hmm. temple for him to, are they offering sacrifices but none of the people were carrying birds mm -hmm. so I wasn't really sure if they brought the birds or if these were pets okay <laughs> um I think whoo that's a lot I I, I, I do remember <laughs> the chair he was on was just absolutely stunning and there was lots mm -hmm. of beautiful um intricate on the bottom of the chair too the little um what do you call that? The the pegs that hold the fabric together, like and there's engraving. The grommets or yeah, the... it looked like maybe okay. grommets down there, and okay. then some shapes like triangles, and it was okay. very beautiful. It had an Art Deco feel to it to me. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think yeah, I remember that there was the three banners, and one of them had a cross. Oh, there were lots of on the fabrics little like circles with like almost like wheel looking designs. I didn't know what okay. those were. So I think, and I think that's what I remember. <laughs> okay. That was a lot. That was a very good narration. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So once we're done with the narration, when everybody's had a chance to narrate and sometimes as, as you had some questions that came up, what I like to do is let everybody have a chance to narrate. And sometimes you'll find that one student's narration actually answers the questions of another oh, student. Right. Yes. Um, you also don't want to interrupt when somebody's narrating, even to correct, because you can do that after you're done with the um, the narration time. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up again. So you said that you were familiar with Waterhouse. Have you yes. seen this one before? I have, but not. I haven't studied it before. Okay. My favorite okay. Waterhouse is the Ulysses and the Sirens. I love that one too. That's and actually probably in Ophelia. My yeah. Everybody knows the Ophelia one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the Lady of Shalott. Yes. 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 This is not one of his more well known ones, but this is actually one of my favorites. So it's beautiful. This is a painting that some scholars think um, he was inspired 
by a book that was written about 30 years before he painted this one. And you've probably heard of it. It's Wilkie Collins' Antonina um, or The Fall of Rome. Yes. And there's a specific passage in it. And I'm going to read that to you. In the midst of a large flock of poultry, which seemed strangely misplaced on a floor of marble and under a gilded roof, stood a pale, thin, debilitated youth, magnificently clothed and holding in his hand a silver vase filled with grain, which he ever and anon distributed to the cackling multitude at his feet. Nothing could be more pitiably effeminate than the appearance of this young man. His eyes were heavy and vacant, his forehead low and retiring, his cheeks sallow, and his form curved as with a premature old age. An unmeaning smile dilated his thin, colorless lips, and as he looked down on his strange favorites, he occasionally whispered to them a few broken expressions of endearment, almost infantine in their simplicity. His whole soul seemed to be engrossed by the labor of distributing his grain, and he followed the different movements of the poultry with an earnestness of attention which seemed almost idiotic in its ridiculous intensity. If it be asked why a person so contemptible as this solitary youth has been introduced with so much care and described with so much minuteness, it must be answered that though destined to form no important figure in this work, meaning the book, he played from his position a remarkable part in the great drama on which it is founded. For this feeder of chickens was no less a person than Honorius, emperor of Rome. So this is called Favorites of the Emperor Honorius. And the thought is that this particular view was while Rome was being sacked by the Goths. Ah. Um, So that's our setting. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Yeah. And I think there's a lot in it. Um, I mean, you never want to moralize or, you know, Mm -hmm. um, give sort of, like I said, moral lessons while you're doing picture study, you kind of let the lessons come out on their own. And I think this is a powerful piece for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do we know what this, this wheel symbol is on the bottom of like the hem of his, his garment and the one, the gentleman who's bowing? I did not read anything specific about that. I mean, at the time, you know, Rome was kind of a, I think there was, um, it was, he was one of the later emperors of Rome. Mm -hmm. So it could just be, I don't know that it had any necessarily any religious um, significance. It could have just been a decorative pattern Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they used. I didn't read anything specifically about that. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And I'm not sure if they're priests. Um, What I've read is that some people think they're advisors. Um, Yeah, that's what I was wondering as well. But obviously, uh, Christian. (laughs) Yeah, the the yeah the the shaved heads or the like. I think what you said is that they may look like monks. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that the two men in the back generally, it's thought that they were coming to tell him. Rome is being destroyed. What would you like to do? Yeah. While these men in front, you see that one of them, you mentioned that he had a picture of, of with ducks on it. Uh-huh. It's thought that that's a book on birds and they were trying to sort of suck up to him. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. a way. And, you know, they knew he liked birds. So they're all bowing, you know, and be since and yeah. trying to get on his good side. Well, and even the cloth he's sitting on has also some mallard ducks down mm-hmm. on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's very into ducks. It's beautiful. And the style of the throne is Byzantine. Is it? Um, yeah. So beautiful. Very, See, I, it's, go ahead. I don't know enough about Byzantine furniture or architecture yet. I've, I've just got a book on, a couple books on architecture I'm going to start reading. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting how he included all these details. The statue in the back is actually of Julius Caesar. And yep, it's I wondered one that yeah. that was found. Um, let's see. I think it was um, about twenty years before he painted this in Rome. So it was a relatively recent find oh, that wow. he decided to include in it. So that's one thing I love about Waterhouse is the detail, and I think that's where the, kind of that more engineering 
um, sort of math and technology kind of mind yes. comes out in him. So my husband's an engineer and I see that in him that yes. he's very detail oriented. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about his paintings because there's always something to see. So like he's got the banner in the top left that's kind of crooked. Mm -hmm. It's off kilt. And just, it's not, there's, it, it almost feels like there's something wrong with the scene in, in mm -hmm. a certain way, because it was, it was starting the fall of Rome. Oh yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. There certainly is a lot of story in this painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot to wonder about for sure. You know, and the man on the right, he has on shoes, black shoes. Mm -hmm. The other men have sandals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he traveled from a further distance or, mm. yeah, who knows? Well, thank you. That was yeah. super fun. See, yeah. picture study is, is very enjoyable. Children love it. Yes, it's, <laughs> it is fun. So can you tell us why picture study matters? Well, I think, um, I think there's a few reasons why picture study matters. Um, the first I think is that it teaches us beauty. Um, I think in this day and age, in my opinion, we're inundated by a lot of not beauty <laughs> yeah. um, advertisements and kind of cheesy art and vulgar art. Um, there's so many things that we're just, we're always constantly seeing in our children too. I read once a long time ago that most advertisers aim a lot of their stuff at 12 year olds because they want lifelong customers. Mm -hmm. And so when we show them beautiful things, like truly beautiful things like art, we're countering that and we're saying, no, this is true beauty. This is what is beautiful. And I think that's really important. Um, another um, part of picture study is ideas. You know, as, as educators, we use books. We use a lot of books to help our students be exposed to ideas, mm -hmm. but art isn't, isn't any less important in that regard. Artists have important ideas to express as well. They just use a different medium for it. Mm -hmm. And so through their art, they show us ideas like, well, why is Hemper Honorius feeding his birds while his city is being invaded and destroyed? Um, I also believe that art is for everyone. And I think that's something that we really want to instill in our children at a young age. You know, we can kind of get in this mindset of why, why would I go to an art museum? Like that's for, you know, people who have degrees in that or, or, you know, whatever, have live in a, a different realm than me or a different way of life than me. But in reality, and, and Charlotte Mason, or I think it's actually in a parent review article, somebody actually says this, that it's for everybody. It's not just for people who are spe specifically educated in that area right. or anything like that. So those are some reasons why I, I include it. I just think it's, it's also just, in some ways, it can be cathartic to just sit in quiet and look yes. at a painting for a couple of yeah. minutes and just take it all in. And it helps with that those powers of observation too, when you right. have to spend that intentional time noticing the details of a painting, it's really amazing what comes out. I mean, I remember when my kids were very young and we started doing picture study, they were seeing things in these paintings that I had spent hours staring at in dark rooms in college. <laughs> and I had never seen those things because I was guided through the painting and told right. what to look at and they weren't. So yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And I like that picture study shapes the affections, which is mm -hmm. part of our duty as educators and especially yeah. in classical education, shaping mm -hmm. the affections. And um, it, it's really shaping their tastes towards that, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many things flying in their faces that aren't beautiful. And I like, too, that you mentioned it really helps them to learn to attend to sit quietly and to contemplate. And it seems that that would, that skill would also help with learning how to read well, because mm -hmm. you're learning how to read a picture is going to help shape the time, the attention that you need to, sh to read words. Mm -hmm. and, and then also the pictures obviously also put metaphors in your mind. 
mm-hmm. that when you're reading literature, you'll understand the metaphor all the more. Yeah. 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 You're exposed to more things that you will see in literature. I like the beginning. I, I think of this often, the beginning of Thomas Bullfinch's, um, his three set or even just um, age of mythology Mm-hmm. He talks about how it's important to know these myths because they're often referenced in other books and yes. paintings are the same way. Like yes. if you're reading a book and, and it mentions the Mona Lisa, you need to know what the Mona yes. Lisa is or whatever the painting may be. Yes. So it's it's part of our vernacular, even though it, that's becoming less and less, <gasps> which is so sad. But it is something that we should be exposed to even at a young age. It's true. Oh, and my two and a half year old granddaughter loves the Mona Lisa too. Okay. Just from flipping, (laughs) literally just from flipping through art books in my, on my coffee table, she says, she's beautiful, Grandma. Yeah. (laughs) I said, oh, that's the Mona Lisa. And so then I had to buy her the book, Katie's Visit to the Museum with the Mona Lisa. Yeah. And it's with the grandmother, you know? Yes. (laughs) And then, uh, and then the Primavera Botticelli's, you know, Mm -hmm. she knows what that painting is now. We've studied that one quite well. Yeah. And uh, so now we're feeling like she's probably really ready to go to a museum. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think any age really. It's really, really fun Mm -hmm. uh, to see children that are so young light up from art Mm -hmm. that to me is a good reason to do picture study because we as adults you know we just get so caught up in the busy day Mm -hmm. daily grind that to have an experience with a child and watching them love something beautiful Mm -hmm. it draws us in and gives us joy it's kind of like the 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 principle that uh it's be, it's you're, you're filled with more joy when you give than when you receive. Mm-hmm. It's like that with watching children light up with picture study. Just to watch that uh, that joy come in into them is such a delight for me. Yeah, uh, I love it so much. Um, before I ask you the last question that I ask mm-hmm. all my listeners, I do want you to tell our listeners about some of the resources you have on your website. And I'm going to give a shout out to your kindergarten curriculum guide because I, uh, I've i been subscribed to your newsletter for a long time and I, and I read it. It's one of the few that I read. I read like there's three different newsletters I get and yours is one of them. Oh, that I'm I read. honored. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so I, I saw that you had a kindergarten curriculum guide last year, and I knew my daughter was going to be starting kindergarten with my grandson. Mm-hmm. And uh, she, my this daughter was homeschooled Ambleside online, and I knew she would be doing Ambleside. And I said, oh, you might want to look at this because she has four children, five and under. Oh and gosh. I said, this <laughs> might be easier than Ambleside because yeah. it's got a little bit of a schedule that you might like, you know? Mm-hmm. So I sent it to her and she's been using it all year and loves oh, it. Oh, good. I'm and glad so to hear that. I just, I think it's a very great resource and it was very affordable. And so, <laughs> so, <laughs> <I hope> so. <laughs> so she got that. And uh, so, but I want you to tell, so I'm giving a shout out to that, but I want to tell, I want our listeners to hear about some of your other resources as well. Yeah, so I have that. Um, It's very simple and very gentle. And I tried to go in line with what Miss Mason says about, you know, not having formal lessons before the age of six. So when my own kids were getting to that age, my oldest, his birthday is in August. So I wasn't, I don't, I didn't think he was ready for year one when he turned six, which is generally when you start year one. And so I put this together based on different resources I had found. Um, So there's that, the Charlotte Mason inspired kindergarten curriculum. And then I also offer picture study aids and art prints. And so the picture study aids include a biography on the artist. um, And it's, it's very brief to, again, you know, make it, it's, it's about being simple. Um, And they also, I have seven pieces of art Sorry, there's cats running around me, so I'm distracted right now. Um, Seven pieces of art that are covered in each picture study aid. And then I cover like key topics about those paintings. So like, for instance, what I did today with Emperor Honorius is had that little blurb that I read from Wilkie Collins. And um, if there's any story like that, I'll include that in there in the Bible passage. And then anything that pops up in the painting, then it's like, well, what is that? Why is that there? You had some good questions that, you know, it was, it's sort of that sort of thing. Um, 
And then I also sell art prints that are professionally printed and those go along with the picture study aids. And you can buy the book and print sets together or just the art prints. So I offer either one. Mm -hmm. um, I also have seasonal art devotions for the seasons of Advent and Lent. Um, and those just have a piece of art for each week of those seasons. And then I've also found there's a Bible passage that goes on with the piece, goes with the piece of art, and then also a hymn and a poem mm -hmm. that goes with the piece of art as well. And um, then I sell like t-shirts and <laughs> uh, mugs and things like that with Charlotte Mason quotes on them. But um, those are my main things. The yeah. picture study aids are the the main things that I sell. It's a great, your website's a great resource. You even on the website, just walk through the process of, of how to do study. picture study. It's yeah. very, it's a very good resource that I've given to a lot of teachers. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yes. that. And schools and uh, parents should order your picture study packets. They're amazing. <laughs> and so I'm <laughs> excited you. to help you with that. And I will like to announce to our uh, listeners that Rebecca is sponsoring our first uh, um, classical education online conference called Vital Ideas. The theme is Van Gogh. And <laughs> it is, if you go to our website, beautifulteaching.com forward slash conference, you will see that I have an early bird discount right now till April 1st. Uh, it's only $69 and we're going to have 11 speakers. And Rebecca is one of our sponsors and she's going to be giving away a picture study packet. Yeah. And so I'm really excited to have you as one of our sponsors, Rebecca. Well, thanks um, for having me part of it. <laughs> yeah. So as we end our discussion, I'd like you to share with our listeners, you can answer one of two questions. Okay. Um, either a quote from a book that has okay. had a huge impact on you or meant something to you or a book that you wish you had read sooner in your life. Okay. Well, those actually go hand in hand for me. <laughs> um, a quote that actually has been coming up for me a lot in recent years and one that I've shared with a lot of friends is also from a book that I wish I had read a lot earlier. Um, the book is called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And I heard, first heard about it um, six years ago. And it has just really stuck with me ever since I read it. Um, the quote is um, comes from a section on silence. And he says, one of the fruits of silence is freedom to let God be our justifier. Perhaps more than anything else, silence brings us to believe that God can care for us, reputation and all. And one thing that I've really struggled with my whole life, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that, and I hope I'm not alone in that, is really being concerned with how I come across to others if I offend people or what people think of me. And it's come up more and more in recent years and um, this quote kind of made me lean into that idea of being still before mm -hmm. God and just allowing him to take care of everything, including what other people may think of me and not trying to explain myself to people or try to control what, you know, how I think they view me or anything like that. And it's actually been really such a blessing to me. And I've shared it with friends who have been going through like misunderstandings with other groups of people or other friends or, you know, things like that. And so that's been something that, um, like I said, has really stuck with me and has been, has been a relief, has, has been a, a source of peace for me. Okay. Sounds great. I think one of our other guests recently actually had that same book. I'm going to have to go back and listen, but I'm pretty okay, sure. It's a really good book. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard it again. I'm 99% I'm sure one of my recent guests said the same book. Um, so now I'm thinking, I probably need to get this book. <laughs> it's a really good book. I enjoyed Aww. it a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on our website. Yeah, and I will have me. in our show notes, I will have links to your website and encourage our listeners to sign up for your newsletter. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, 
Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven.